everyone a very warm welcome to a Ramadan special of Coffee in Palestine. I'm Nell Burden. I'm currently standing in the centre of Ramallah. Usually there would be a celebratory atmosphere as people shop buying last minute goods and products in order to celebrate breaking a fast with their families and friends. But this year is different. As you can see around me, all of the shops are shut and the place is literally a ghost town as people mourn the massacre taking place in Gaza. As the death toll mounts in Gaza, Ramallah has been closed on a daily basis. Anger is mounting, particularly in areas along the border, amongst communities living in cramped conditions in refugee camps, where demonstrations are now taking place on a daily basis. The wall bordering these communities delineates the entire stretch of land of the West Bank and the Jordan borders to Jordan, one which upon completion will span 700 kilometers in length. This is considered to be the most symbolic structure of oppression for Palestinians and one that represents the walls of an outdoor prison. Illegal Israeli settlement construction along this barrier is also rife. Diggers near the border trench out dirt, ready for hundreds of new settlement homes. Where Palestinians in these areas are rarely issued building permits, Jewish-only settlement expansion continues at a rapid rate. I met with Human Rights Director of Al-Haq, Shawan Jabarin, to discuss whether the situation in the West Bank was deteriorating and whether we may be heading in the direction of a third intifada. Okay, Shawan Jabarin, thank you very much for joining us today for Coffee in Palestine on this wonderful evening. Um, now, first of all, um, as the director of Al-Haq, I want to know uh, the general statement coming from Al-Haq or your uh, press release about the issues not only taking place in Gaza, but also the reaction to this from both Jerusalem and, um, and the West Bank. Look what's going on. I think it's uh, continuous uh, actions, mainly uh, by Israeli uh, authorities and by the Israeli military. It's not an isolated incident, what's happened in Jerusalem, what's happened in West Bank, and what's going on these days also in West Bank and uh, Gaza, what's going on also in Haifa, not just in uh, West Bank or Gaza. Uh, I think this is the oppressive regime, this is part of the oppression. Uh, this is also beside also the, uh, a policy and official policy. I think this is part of the culture of the uh, Israeli officials, the Israeli uh, institutions. Part of the culture, you know, targeting and oppressing, oppressing you know, uh, Palestinians. Because the regime as a whole, I think, it's an oppressive regime. The, uh, uh, the long-term goal and the long-term plan, uh, I think, pushing them to take all of these actions against Palestinians. And the long-term plan is, uh, to push Palestinians outside of their country, not to deal with them as a people with the rights, not to respect, you know, and to agree and to accept uh, their fundamental rights and mainly, you know, the rights of self-determination as a fundamental rights for any people, you know, over the world. But actually, I just want to pick you up on one of the points. Uh, we're talking about the Palestinian reaction to this, uh, particularly from the, um, not only the people from the streets in the West Bank and Jerusalem, but on a um, on the level of the governmental level, how is Mahmoud Abbas responding to this? Um, I know recently he went to a meeting for donors, um, and he's essentially asking them to help build Gaza back up again. But at the moment, it's actually been taken down. So, is he not on the wrong track here? Look, when you compare uh, his actions these days with uh, 2012, when the attack happened at that time. I think there are some differences. One of the differences is 
uh, he started acting, you know, uh, uh, act uh, since the first day. And he tried to contact, you know, some uh, countries here, there, the Americans, Egyptians, uh, to put a ceasefire in uh, any place. Uh, the question is, if it's that enough, uh, what's about the narrative of uh, uh, the Palestinian leaders? Uh, I think uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, he was cornered by the uh, Israelis and he didn't get anything, but in the same time he, did, uh, he, he doesn't use the uh, Palestinian resistance, his people, you know, resistance, and he doesn't stand behind uh, these things fully and using that, you know, for the Palestinians' interest, long-term interest. I think another thing is we have no institutions. Uh, just I have been repeating, you know, uh, that in the last few days I said uh, we have no leadership. Mm -hmm. We have one person, you know, now he is uh, acting on behalf of Palestinians. Uh, he's trying to make politics, you know, his name is Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, we have no institutions. We have a name of an institution called uh, PLO Executive Committee. Unfortunately, this is the reality. Uh, when they vote, you know, in uh, specific direction, completely he ignored, you know, uh, their position, he ignored the majority, and even within Fatah, he ignored the majority and he is taking uh, what he does believe personally, you know, in uh, politics. This is one of the problems. It makes, you know, the Palestinian life, or let me say the Palestinian political regime very weak, and uh, that's the case, but when you go to the street, for instance, and you see the reaction, the reaction criticized. Right. Uh, all of the people, you know, criticize the Palestinian leaders and all of the people, they are standing behind the resistance. Right. right. But if all of the people are criticizing and they're stand, standing behind the resistance, then why are people like Mahmoud Abbas still in power? And the same with the Hamas. Do you think they're really representing their people in Gaza? I think, you know, why uh, things continue, because the Palestinian Authority in general, you know, established, which called like a, a bureaucratic uh, body, depending on salaries and uh, things like that. You know, the Palestinians in their life, you know, most of them you can speak about maybe 180,000 uh, uh, families, you know, depends on uh, the, uh, uh, the salary, the funding and uh, external aids and all of these things. That's the uh, bureaucratic body, you know, it was established in the last 20 years. Uh, I think uh, this is one of the main problems that we are facing. Uh, uh, these days. Some of them, they have an interest, direct interest, you know, to keep the situation continue as it is. The others, they are not ready even to pay the price, you know, to face the uh, reality in the ground. Uh, we have to address all of these things. This is part of the challenges that we are facing. But I think it doesn't work for a long term. When you see, you see like, we are, I think, in a transitional time. Mm -hmm. We see, you know, some changing. We see, you know, okay, the young so people, how they are thinking. When we talk about young people and we say we're in a transitional moment in politics now, actually, it seems like the really angry people are those living next to the wall, for example, in Abu Dhabi, for example, in Kalandia, in Hebron, um, in Bethlehem. These disparate communities, refugees, the same in Shoafat refugee camp, obviously after the killing of Mohammed Abu Khader, there were mass demonstrations. But these places seem to be a bubbling pot, really, of anger. Do you think this will help to change the pivotal moment in politics if these people do come out en masse? I think we are in a process of change. Uh, sooner or later. We are in a process. It takes its time. Uh, it will not happen in uh, one day and one night. Uh, things maybe uh, it needs, uh, let me say, months or years. Uh, but I can feel that, I can see that in uh, people's discussions, you know, now they are, uh, what they do believe about, uh, you know, the, which called the peace process, what they do believe about you know the uh, the future of Palestinians, uh, the narrative, the case of Palestine, all of these things you can feel that now in the students' discussions, you can feel that in a conferences discussion, you can feel that with the ordinary people discussions in a service or in a coffee shop everywhere. I think the people they are they feel uh, angry and they uh, don't believe and they don't trust their leadership that and they criticize them even including those they are part of Fatah those the, you know the supporters of Fatah of uh, Mahmoud Abbas now they are you know criticizing uh, them uh, that's the uh, real nature of the Palestinian uh, people 
things like that, uh, anger like that, uh, criticism like that, it'll, it will not go without uh, change, it will not go without uh, price, but it takes time. Uh, I think uh, uh, the time, I can't give you know, an exact time, but I can say in uh, two or three years uh, something will happen internally regarding you know, the Palestinian uh, leadership. Something like a change, for instance, a change, uh, the change of the narrative because the Israelis is clear even. For the international community it's clear, but they don't want to recognize that. That Israel, they don't need the peace. Israel, you know, uh, for them, uh, the content of the peace means, you know, to build like a state for the settlers here in West Bank and cantons, you know, here and there, isolated cantons for Palestinians, but not a real state, uh, and to push Gaza, you know, to, uh, to the south. And between a time and time, you know, they carry out a campaign against Palestinians here or there, mainly against those they are fighting or struggling or resisting, you know, against the occupation. Are they not succeeding in that now? You know, they've taken over the majority of the West Bank. People are being squeezed, essentially, into very small areas of the West Bank, Palestinians. They're ghettoizing uh, the West Bank. And now, I mean, we're seeing these um, offensive on Gaza. There's a pattern. It's happening every couple of years, every two, three years. This is the fourth serious offensive since 2006. Um, even if there is an uprising, what difference can that make now? Look, I think... Uh if I look at the big picture and if I look at the, what's happened in the last uh, 20 years, I think uh, Oslo uh, agreement or Oslo era, let me say, now reached the end, reached the end. Now no one believe about uh, Oslo, no one uh, believe about the way, you know, how the Palestinians and the Israeli dealt, which called with the peace uh, solution or something like that. Uh, and now everything uh, is clear. I think the Israelis, they are becoming weak and weak, uh, even if they are strong and they can, for instance, uh, uproot Gaza uh, in two hours, you know, in, uh, uh, this is, you know, the uh, reality. They are strong, they are strong enough. But I think morally and their image now is uh, damaged, uh, even before, you know, the people outside, uh, the public, for instance, in Europe, in the U.S., everywhere, you know, uh, Israel face is clear that it's uh, a criminal, you know, uh, let me say state, and it's crime state. That's the, uh, the case. Another thing is, you know, even when you look at the resistance uh, these days in, uh, in Gaza, I think the message that sent, you know, even uh, there is no balance, you know, between the both sides in, uh, in power and militarily, I mean, uh, but uh, it's easy to say that the things that you use it yesterday, I can is, uh, use it today. And the Israelis, they can't continue forever, depends on, uh, on power. You know, power, it's a changeable thing in history, things like that. And more than that, I think they lost their uh, morality. They lost their, you know, everything when they kill, you know, children, when they are targeting civilians just to broken down the resistance. They are not targeting these days, you know, the uh, real resistance in Gaza. They are targeting the families and poor people, you know, uh, children, families, women, everything like that. The numbers, you know, say that clearly. The houses that they are demolishing and destroying is clearly. I think a state like that doing all of these atrocities, I think it has no future for a long term. And the Israelis, they have to stop, I think, and to, re to rethink and to reevaluate their strategy, where they are going. That's the thing, you know. If you ask me, I feel that even with all of these atrocities now happening in Gaza, for a long term, I think Gaza, it will kill them. Joanne and Javarin, I'm going to have to stop you there with the intention behind the killing. Uh, we've just run out of time, but thank you very much for joining us today for Coffee in Palestine. It was a very interesting discussion, so we hope for you to join us again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the coffee and for everything. You're very welcome. Anytime.
As public anger continues to grow from Israeli bombardment of the Gaza Strip, mass demonstrations have gripped the nation as Palestinians call for an end to the world's silence about the massacres taking place. On this day of rage, hundreds of Palestinians have joined together outside Albiru municipality, ready to march towards the occupation in Galandia. They are holding up banners saying, your silence is killing our civilians, especially our children. And they've asked for this to be reflected now throughout the world. The Palestinians in West Bank, in fact, started before Gaza Strip uh, because the Israeli aggressive uh, at attack against the Palestinians started in the West Bank before uh, uh, the G Gaza Strip. Uh, the Palestinians now are feeling more anger, anger because of the situation uh, uh, in Gaza Strip and because of the daily massacres committed by the Israeli uh, uh, army against uh, the civilians in Gaza uh, Strip. What's happening now that we are witnessing a development of an, uh, a popular uh, re uh, response? by the Palestinians started today by the, a call for a day of anger in the West Bank. I think this will be repeated in uh, several uh, Palestinian uh, cities. Besides that, uh, uh, this will be also repeated in some of the Palestinian communities uh, abroad, in particular in Lebanon, uh, in uh, uh, Germany, in Sweden, and other places where the Palestinians uh, 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 can uh, hold uh, acti uh, solidarity activity uh, with the Palestinian people in uh, uh, the West Bank. We are here demonstrating with people from Ramallah and support of our brothers and our sisters in Gaza that are under a brutal Israeli attack, um, being killed and injured, their houses being demolished, and we're just frustrated and we're angry and we're here to just tell them that we support them and we are with them in their, in their struggle. I don't think anything is enough for Gaza. I don't know what we can do. We're out here because we don't know what we can do. And what makes it worse is when our own Palestinian Authority, the police from our own uh, authority stops us from trying to protest more and trying to protest directly against the Israeli occupation. I think uh, every action the Palestinian uh, can do is uh, important and uh, efficient to what's happening in Gaza. There is a border uh, surrounded the Gaza. We can't enter to, to the city there. So we can uh, support them in, in a single action, in, in something very simple. Uh, from uh, sharing uh, our feelings on the social media, in the media in general, uh, to, to join like this pro uh, protest. I think every single action can do something important to support them. That night, Palestinians were prevented from entering the Beit El illegal Israeli settlement for their demonstration by Palestinian police. I, I just came here with like a week ago from America, and what I see against the Palestinian in Gaza, this is something that I don't see fair for the Palestinians, killing kids, ladies, women, everybody, like everybody's under to the terrorism of Israeli soldiers. And um, I hope this stop, and um, I hope also the Palestinians um, uh, here, just let us pass by and get through to um, show the Israeli side how the terrorists are against Isra Palestinians here. The next night, almost 20,000 Palestinians gathered outside Alamari refugee camp in Ramallah and marched to Kalandia checkpoint, the Israeli border that isolates people of the West Bank from their Jerusalemite neighbors. Fierce clashes ensued as Israelis fired tear gas, rubber bullets and finally live bullets. As Palestinians continued fierce resistance throwing stones, Molotov cocktails and fireworks, two Palestinians were killed 
and hundreds injured. And this is the culmination of growing public anger over the previous week. On the night of the holiest night of Ramadan, Leila and Qadar, I now have 10,000 protesters behind me. They're firing fireworks towards Kalandia checkpoint and they're responding now with tear gas, rubber bullets and live bullets. So far we've had news that many people have suffered head injuries and one person has been killed. Oh, no, 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 no.